Well, he told the story so we can go home. Oh, it is so awesome to be here uh, among friends. But I, I want to begin by telling you guys that I've had some hard decisions to make in my life, but the easiest decision I ever made in my life was to become a plaintiff for the Alliance Defending Freedom back in September of 2006. Uh, my journey began as an atheist back in 1993 and uh, when I was hired as a professor at UNC Wilmington, and they loved me back then. <laughs> And uh, then I, uh, I converted uh, after a visit, a, a prison visit to Ecuador. I was doing some human rights work in 1996, and I converted to theism after a visit on death row uh, in 1999, uh, doing my work as a criminologist. Uh, I later went through a study of Christianity and converted to Christianity in the year 2000. And around 2002, I made a decision to start speaking out about the systematic abuses of free speech on college campuses and the tremendous double standards that were going on. And so I wrote for about four years. I started writing for uh, the American Family Association's Agape Press, and then I moved on and was hired by townhall.com. And uh, as it came time for me to face that decision, as I went up for promotion to full professor in 2006, I was talking to, to then ADF attorney David French about about the possibility that they might try to retaliate against me uh, for uh, expressing uh, my uh, doubts about their commitment to free expression. And we were sort of prepared for this, and uh, we got that adverse ruling back on September 15th of 2006, and I demanded a reason, and I received a letter that said I was deficient in every single area, teaching, research, and service. And as I read the letter, I was staring right at my 1998 Professor of the Year award and looking at my year 2000 Professor of the Year Award uh, that I'd won before I converted to Christianity. And I picked up the phone and there was no question about who I was going to call. I called the Alliance Defending Freedom and made a decision that day that we were going to fight. Easiest decision I ever made in my life, but I had no idea how difficult that the road was going to be. Uh, our case was simply a circumstantial case. Uh, they loved me when I was on the other side. I converted and things began to happen. There was some evidence of retaliation, but we began with what was simply a circumstantial case. And so I really began by applauding the attorneys at the ADF for taking a risky case that was a circumstantial case. We made that decision in 2006. In 2007, on April 10th, we filed in federal court in Greenville, North Carolina, and then we had to go and, and beat the obligatory, of course, motion to dismiss from the university because they never admit wrongdoing. They always fight because they're doing it with your tax dollars. And so they fought us in the year 2008, and my attorneys, Travis Bearham, is here this evening, and he worked on that, and David Hacker and uh, Jordan Wartz, there are a number of attorneys, uh, Jeff Ventrella, many of them here, uh, worked and had to work very hard in those initial stages. And we succeeded, and thank God Almighty that that meant that we were able to move uh, into the year 2009 and to move through e-discovery and move into depositions. That took a while because the administration had written 3,000 pages of emails about me. They were sending a lot of emails back and forth, and we began to actually get direct evidence in the case. And I mention it because people are often confused. I mean, there are Christians out there who don't know if they're in favor of Christian litigation. Well, the problem is that they don't understand the difference between the lost and the Pharisees. Pharisees are false teachers who are teaching untruths and they are fully aware of it. And those are the people who are in charge of our universities. And so we were able to get these internal emails before they sat down and met. All of these professors were asked to evaluate me along the lines of teaching and research and service. And they weren't mentioning anything about my academic articles. They were logging on to townhall.com. And I am convinced that I know where the, the term hate speech comes from. It's speech that the left hates because they are not intelligent to re enough to rebut it. That is the problem. It is a projection of their intellectual inadequacies because they went crazy reading these columns. I mean, most normal people just stop reading stuff that they hate, but they were into it. <clears throat> 
And so we were also able to get internal emails that showed that even the chancellor of the university had tried to change the promotion criteria uh, to add a new category of collegiality simply because she was angry because I criticized her in a public fashion. And thank God almighty, we found all of that direct evidence. So what do you think happens when we find all of this direct evidence in 2009? Of course, the other side just immediately gives up, right? Wrong. What they decided to do, and I don't want to get you know, bogged down in, in a bunch of legal terminology and, and talk about Supreme Court precedent and all that. All the lawyers here know about the Garcetti decision from 2006. And the university tried to interpret this Supreme Court decision to suggest that when I wrote columns publicly that they were fully protected by the First Amendment, but that when I simply mentioned them on my promotion application, suddenly they were transformed into official duties and they had no First Amendment protection whatsoever. For years I'd been accusing them of not supporting the First Amendment, and their response in the lawsuit was, you can't say that. <laughs> that was my point, right? So we were shocked when they made the argument and a very aggressive interpretation of Garcetti versus Sabalas. I think we were even more shocked when on the 10th of March, 2010, Judge Malcolm Howard in my case accepted their argument and he threw the case out of court. Wow, in 2010. Um, one of the worst days of my life uh, because when that decision was rendered, that was eight years into my career as a person who was an activist talking about the First Amendment on college campuses. And here I am holding myself out as this expert on campus free speech. And we suffered this crushing defeat. Uh, you know, it was interesting that morning, um, you know, we, we, we got the, the very bad news. Uh, that afternoon, I, I should say, we got the very bad news that it had been thrown out of court. And by that evening, it was on all of the headlines on the evening news. UNCW professor loses lawsuit against university. I did not sleep that night, but I got up the next morning at about 9.30 in the morning, because I, I have tenure, I still had tenure. Some of you get that. I got that easily when I was a leftist. Um, but about 9.30 in the morning, I actually, I was up and I was doing my morning reading when I received a phone call from a young ADF attorney by the name of Joseph Martins. And Joseph called me on the phone and he said, you know, I'm terribly sorry for what happened yesterday. And you're a friend of mine and, and I'm, I, I wish that I could have been the one who broke the news to you. And I'm very sorry that this thing happened. He says, but I want you to know this isn't defeat. This is Providence. And I am so glad that was a long distance phone call because if Joe Martins was in that room, he's bigger than me, but I probably would have punched him. What are you talking about? You know, suggesting that this was not a defeat, that this was Providence. He said, well, ADF hasn't made the decision yet, but I predict that they're gonna make the decision to appeal this before the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. And he goes, and I think we're gonna win. But you know what? If we appeal to the Fourth Circuit and we lose, I'll bet we decide to appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. And can you imagine what that would be like? All the liberals on the Supreme Court would understand the implications of the decision for academic freedom. Then you'd win. You'd get to go to the Supreme Court. He said, no, this isn't a defeat. This is providence. And I began to think one of my lawyers was insane. <laughs> I was so angry at him. So I go into work that morning at about 11 o'clock because I, I have tenure. And still, somehow. And I, I showed up there and I thought my career was over. No one wants to hear what Mike Adams has to say about the First Amendment anymore. And, and all of a sudden the phone rings and this kid, uh, who we will call Tim, because that's his name, <laughs> calls me from Rhode Island. And he says, we want you to come to our college to give a speech on the First Amendment. And I said, well, what's the honorarium? Because I'm a capitalist now and everything, I converted. <laughs> And he told me, and I said, oh, oh absolutely, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll be there. When is it? Sure, I'll be there. And I said, what college is this? He says, this is Providence College. I said, um, where are you calling from? He says, this is Providence. And I said, is this Joe? No, it's Tim. <laughs> 
So they hire me, and uh, I thought it was one of these God wings, you know, and I, I decided for the first time, wow, I think everything's going to be okay. And so we continue, um, I do nothing, but my attorneys, of course, uh, continue to fight uh, through the year 2010, and they won an opportunity for oral argument on January 26th of 2011. It was fantastic. Travis, who's in this room, was there, and Jordan Lawrence, and it was just amazing. Uh, and David French was there, and it was an incredible thing because we had an opportunity to really see the Attorney General, the Associate Attorney General, just break down in there. And he made this very aggressive position, and we kind of knew going into the argument that two of the uh, appellate judges were on our side, but this Reagan appointee, Niemeyer, did not seem to be on our side. He then begins to throw out hypotheticals, and he says, well, you're saying that if someone mentions something on a promotion application, well, they give a speech, it loses First Amendment protection. And he directly asked Tom Zyko, he says, could they go and get a copy of the speech and read it and then figure out, no, this guy is pro-life and, and, and because he's pro-life, we can't have him at the rank of full professor? And he, the attorney general would not back down off of that position. And Niemeyer's telling him over and over, that seems like an awfully aggressive position. In other words, you better change your argument because I'm trying to help you. But he didn't change. And so I wasn't surprised at all when on April 11th, we got that decision from the Fourth Circuit and it was a unanimous three to nothing decision deciding Garcetti does not apply to college professors. It does not apply to academic freedom. And our case was thrown back in court. And Joe Martins had credibility without a doubt. I began thinking, it is providence. And he was telling me, this will be a precedent. This will be in the First Amendment law books. And he was correct. The Ninth Circuit has taken up the view six, since then. It has become an important precedent. But you know, at that point when the university was staring down the barrel and looking at the possibility of a jury trial, at that point you would think they will settle. Boy, my attorneys were called in in September of uh, 2011. Uh, my ADF attorneys were called in for mediation and they made a decision not to try to settle the case. They decided that they were going to insult them personally with extremely, extremely low offers. And I was embarrassed for my university and I was very sad about what had happened. And so they, after that, decided to try to file on the basis of the facts, another summary judgment motion. They did that. And the judge would rule on it 18 months later and decide once again that uh, their arguments uh, were lacking. And so there we were once again facing the possibility of a jury trial. And Judge Malcolm Howard decides that he's going to order us to sit down for negotiations again on October 29th, just last year, 2013. And we go and we're sitting there in a federal courthouse in Wilmington, North Carolina, and they come back again with these insulting offers. My attorneys have flown in from across the country doing everything in their ability to settle this thing amicably and acting like Christians, but facing people who believe that they were bulletproof and we were unable to settle the case. And that's when I realized just the day before my 49th birthday, we are, we're going to trial and Judge Malcolm Howard would in fact set a trial for the 17th of March, 2014. And he'd lay it out so that both sides had exactly six hours for opening statements and, and direct examination and cross-examination and closing arguments. It was to be a simple trial and I thought it should be a simple trial. And we filed into that courtroom. It was absolutely amazing, but we, we, we filed into that courtroom for a three-day trial and they got what we thought, what I thought was a, a fairly favorable jury. And we finally sat down for an opportunity to go into the, the heart of the case after jury selection. It would turn into a four-day trial. And I was so excited the first full day of that trial to have an opportunity to get up in front of a jury of my peers and tell my story and to present the evidence of how when I was an atheist, I had very high teaching evaluations from the students and I had high peer evaluations as well. But then suddenly after I converted, my teaching evaluations from the students remained high, but all of a sudden from the faculty, they just began to tank. And we began to show the list of referee publications of me versus the people who voted against me. And we simply laid all of the evidence out and we told a story that was true and that made sense for three hours. And it was awesome. And then we went and we had lunch and we came back for cross-examination. It was not awesome. <laughs> I prefer direct over, for the record. I got up on the stand 
And I sat there for two hours while the associate attorney general, Stephanie Brennan, sat there and just read snippets from my opinion columns. At, at that point, I'd written 900 columns for townhall.com, and they started to pull up statements that they knew were from political satires. They knew were from parodies, and they start just presenting these isolated sentences, and they have nothing to do with the meaning of the articles, and they played the race card from the bottom of the deck, and the gender card as well. And I remember leaving the courtroom that afternoon, and I thought to myself, I apologize to my attorneys, and I said, we've lost this case. And it's amazing, my attorneys reassured me and they said, you know, when we took this case, we'd read your columns. We knew what we were getting into, but I couldn't sleep that evening. I was absolutely convinced that almost seven years to the day after filing the suit, we lost. And then all of a sudden, it is our chance to cross-examine my department chair, the Marxist department chair who speaks openly of a revolution in the United States of America, which is funny because they don't have guns, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> anyway, her cross-examination only took one hour, and was it incredible? My attorneys got up there and decided just to ask her the same questions they asked her in deposition five years previously, except she forgot to do something before the trial. She forgot to read her deposition, and she, got to, she forgot to prepare. Pride cometh before a fall, and it was ugly. Every time she would say something that contradicted her testimony, Travis Bearham, boom, there he was. He popped it up on the screen, and the jury was glued to the drama. She was caught in a contradiction. Which statement is true, this or that? She says, both are true. And, and she's, she's caught lying about something. And, and, and at one point in, in the cross-examination, she says, thanks for reminding me. She's thanking my attorneys as they expose her for committing perjury in a federal trial <laughs> three times in the course of one hour. At the end of that testimony, I realized all hope was not lost. I thought, we have a chance to win this thing. We go into the final day and David French decides to get up there and he's going to give an impassioned defense of the First Amendment. And he gets up there and he talks about how we need a constitution, but a constitution is not enough. We need a Bill of Rights as well to protect religious liberty, to protect, to protect free speech. And as he is giving this history lesson, I see this woman sitting on the front row, nodding so vigorously. She has Tea Party written all over her face. <laughs> she is nodding so vigorously, I begin to develop a fear that she will fall on the floor in the middle of the courtroom and injure her. So I didn't want to lose her. <laughs> and French finishes and the jury is charged, and they go out to have lunch and deliberate, and they return in one hour and 50 minutes. And I see this woman come walking back into the courtroom holding the envelope. She's the floor person. <laughs> oh my good, I am about to have a cardiac arrest, and I'm a jogger, wow, it's incredible. And, and she hands the verdict form off to the clerk, and the clerk reads the verdict. And I, and I turn to my attorneys and I says, does that mean we won? And they said, yeah, we won. And the judge said something and banged something, I think it was a gavel. I don't know what was going on, but all of a sudden I see this procession of tech supporters Three attorney generals, or three uh, council members for the, for the university, and a row of defendants, because we beat them all on all counts. The chair, the former chair, the dean, the chancellor, and the board of trustees. <laughs> they go walking out of that room, and they don't know what has hit them. And my goodness, that drive home was excellent. <laughs> we got a text message, thank you, uh, uh, congratulations from Sarah Palin. It was incredible. She tags me on Facebook the next day. It's surreal. I slept so well that night, and I slept very well the next night. 
And I got in my car and I drove home two and a a half hours to Wilmington, North Carolina after spending a week in a hotel room fighting this epic First Amendment battle. And the very day that I got home was the weekend that God Isn't Dead was released. And all of a sudden, hundreds of people start to write to me. And they say, we're praying for you. We saw your case in the credits. And And it was just loaded with all these ADF cases in the credits. And they're writing, and I just kept writing back, no, we won, no, we won, no, we won, send. Finally, we called him, could you change your credits? We won. And it was amazing because it, it was at that point that I realized what we were in this for. It's to set an example for young people who are walking into the lion's den. That's what it's about. We teach by our actions, we teach by doing. A couple of weeks later, Judge Malcolm Howard orders the university to promote me to the highest rank of full professor and orders the university to pay me $50,000 in back pay. I may or may not have bought some firearms, but we're not going to talk. I'm going to talk about that in my Texas speech, not here. But at any rate, no, uh, amazingly, one of the most fantastic things about this was the university that didn't settle a couple of weeks after that then was ordered to write a check to the Alliance Defending Freedom for $710,000 in legal fees. Wow. That is a lot of ammunition, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, to sue Pharisees in higher education. And it was incredible after I rested for a couple of weeks, uh, and I I was exhausted, to be serious. I was completely exhausted. I I got an invitation to speak in North Raleigh, North Carolina uh, at a Baptist church, and I went and I gave a speech on the trial. And I just kind of talked about what we'd gone through and our epic battle, and I did that. And when it was over, I was walking out of the church, and the most incredible thing happened. Someone comes up and grabs me by the bicep, and I turned around, and I look, and there is an elderly black man who grabs me by the arm, and he just looks down at me. He's about six foot four, and he looks down at me, and he says, I just want to thank you for that thing that you've done for our people. And I just, it really caught me off guard, because I said, my goodness, this is a man who lived through segregation. And one of the few people in this country who realizes that we are all involved, black and white, in an epic civil rights struggle in the United States of America. That's what he meant. And I responded to him by just uh, looking and, and, and what I always do when people try and compliment me on what I've done, it just was so easy to do. It was so right to do. I get a little, I feel awkward when they do that. So I said, well, you don't understand. The Lord's been raising me up to do this thing since 1993 when he brought me in as an atheist and he knew what my fate would be. He knew that I would convert. And that elderly black man looked at me and he stuck his finger in my face and he says, no. He said, the Lord been raising you up to do this thing since you was a little boy. And he turned and he walked off. Wow. And it put things into perspective because as I look around this evening, I see a lot of young people. And uh, your battles are going to be epic. Your struggles are going to be great. But let me tell you something. You're here for a reason. You're not here by chance. You're here because the Lord's been raising you up to do something great since you were little boys and little girls. And this is not chance, this is providence. This is providence. But I also wanna say something to all the attorneys who have already found their place in life and found their purpose in life and all of the donors and all of the supporters and everyone in the media who's here, everyone who supports the ADF. I just wanna thank you as well. I wanna thank you what you've done for our people. I wanna thank you for what you're doing for our people. And I want to thank you for what you're going to continue to do for our people, because we know that we are here for a reason. This is not chance. This is providence. Thank you. And God bless you all. Thank you so much.